Hello, my name is Robbie Russell. I'm the VP of Engineering and a partner at Planet Argon. We help companies with existing Ruby on Rails applications make them better and more maintainable. In this presentation, I'm going to provide you with an introduction to how our team approaches reviewing and auditing existing Ruby on Rails applications when prospective clients reach out to us. But first, an overview. At a high level, I'll explain what we mean by a code audit and review, and then I'll touch on why our team bothers with them at all. I'll then touch on a few scenarios that you might be able to reflect on and to determine whether or not your application might benefit from an audit. And then we'll walk through eight initial steps that we take to evaluate the health of an application. And at the end of this, if you're a dev, perhaps you can start incorporating this process yourself. And perhaps if you own a Ruby on Rails application and are not a developer, this might help you get at least have a little bit more understanding of what you should be looking for if you were to approach a new developer or a new agency to work on this project. So first, what the hell is a code audit anyways? Essentially, it's a third party review of an existing code base. It's kind of like how your mortgage company requires an inspection before finalizing your home purchase. Our aim here is to provide the application stakeholders, i.e. business owners, product owners, investors, developers, with an independent assessment of what problems might be lurking under the surface. Typically, our final deliverable is a polished document that talks through the Ruby on Rails best practices, security, concerns, system architecture, performance, and long-term maintainability. We typically provide this in the form of a PDF, and then that way they can distribute that amongst their other stakeholders and have some uh, kind of a, a deliverable that they can you know, share and reflect on going forward. And you know, this will come in handy as they onboard other developers in the future as well. So this kind of evolving document over time. So how do we approach them? So when, when potential clients come to us with an existing application or they one of these scenarios where you might need one, uh, we offer our clients a fixed cost estimate for a code audit. We typically will base that in the size of, based on the, the size of the code base by running rake stats. As a general rule of thumb, we try to complete these anywhere from 30 to 50 hours, give or take, of developer time. We're big on time boxing here so that we can say, okay, let's we're gonna put 40 hours and we kind of multiply that by our kind of mid-range hourly rate and then try to account for some time that it's going to take to kind of work on copy editing and bringing some other people in to help polish that document. And then at the end of that, the deliverable, what is, what is it going to include? It's going to include an overview of the application, details about gems and gem files, hosting environment and deployment details, test coverage and code completeness, system architecture, and potential recommended next steps and how we would prioritize those for folks. So as we kind of look through this, what sort of scenarios do we find ourselves proposing code audits for prospective clients. So here's a few scenarios. Has your application been bouncing between a number of developers for a few years? Are you currently reaching, are you, are you trying to get new investment for your application? Are you potentially selling your application to another company? You know, these are common things, like I mentioned, like kind of like when you have a home and you're getting a new mortgage and you need to do a home inspection, these are common things. Or if you're going to get your car, if you're selling a used car, someone may want to take it to a mechanic to get their third party assessment before you know, they take your word for just how great the code base is, or, or in that case, how great the engine is, or the brakes and what have you. Another really common thing is if you know, we end up working with companies that are working on getting VC funding and things as well. Other scenarios that are also quite important is, uh, has your application felt quite unstable? Do similar bugs keep reappearing? Are you aiming to ramp up your marketing campaigns in the near future and are a little nervous about, the how, about how the application will perform under that extra pressure? Are you hearing the words, we need to scrap this and start over from your developers? You might want a third party assessment before you make a decision. Okay, so you need a code audit, now what? Here's kind of eight steps that we take to kind of start a, a code audit process. And there's a lot of details we can get further in and we'll do that at, at another, in another presentation where we can dive deeper into the Ruby on Rails code, best practices and such. But here's some high level details that we can run through that I think any developer could probably check on within you know 15 to 20 minutes. So let's assume that we are going to be taking your Ruby on Rails project and cloning it for the very first time to our local development environment. So the application is not running at this point. So first things we're gonna check on are, is there a Ruby version file? So if you're using, if you're a developer and work on multiple projects, you might be using RBMV or RVM to manage different versions of Ruby. And so 
just check to see that there's a Ruby version in there and then it's mentioned and it touches on which version. And then you can also check to see how long ago that specific version, if there are security patches that need to be you know, addressed, and we'll touch on that in, in an upcoming, a little later in this talk. We'll also want to make sure that the Ruby matches what is running out on staging and production server environment. So you might want to, if you can find access to that information, I would, you know, do, do check on that. And having a Ruby version is basically the current convention for how to do that. This might also exist in the top of the gem file. Ideally, it probably ex exists in both. Jumping over to the gem file, is it sourcing uh, rubygems.org? And if so, is it doing that over SSL? We, you know, historically, we were find projects come our way that started back in Rails 2 or 3 and have evolved over the years. And uh, at some point, Ruby Gems started doing this over SSL and we would recommend that. So that way, the when, it, when you're downloading uh, gems and stuff to install them, that's happening over SSL versus not SSL. And that just adds a little bit more security and encryption through both sides of that process. Are the Ruby versions matching what we saw in Ruby in the Ruby version file? What version of Rails is being referenced? Is there any organization within the gem file? Are versions locked? Do we see a bunch of gems mentioned without some version specified? This can cause some problems when new developers are getting run on the project. Do you see groups of gems? For example, do you see things that are, where a list of collection of gems that are only needed in development, perhaps in deployment tools, or th gems that are only needed in the test environment? or maybe only in production. Those are pretty common things. Is there any documentation? Are there any comments in the application? Uh, so f quite commonly, you know, we'll find an application that, you know, that continues to grow for a period of time, and it's easy to forget which gems are used for what, especially if you're inheriting a project. So it's kind of like just providing some more context. Like if you have, let's say, a collection of gems related to file uploads, you might kind of organize those together and put some comments about which tools you're using for uploading, what tools you're using for resizing or color, um, optimizing and performance tuning and things like that. And having kind of some sense of what these gems are used for. Because another thing what ends up happening is sometimes we find gems that uh, we'll be working on the project and we find out two years later that a gem that version has not been updated and we go to update it and then we actually find out that the gem hadn't ever really been used in the code base or it was removed but not officially removed from the code base like three or four years ago and so just getting a better sense of like what the hell is this gem used for and is it still even being used like just providing a little bit of comments in your in your gem file could help you know future developers make sense of what's there because i know you're always going to be a little hesitant to rip something out that you don't really understand if it's being used or not and so you know, leave yourself a, you know, a little note for the future. Moving over to step three, we'll check for security issues. So there's this nice tool called Bundler Audit that we use, which will, basically what it does is you run this, you can install this gem called Bundler Audit, and then you run Bundle Audit on your code base, and it will check against the gemfile.lock file uh, against a database of known vulnerabilities of different Ruby versions. So it's pretty amazing. So it'll basically spit out a list of all the gems that have known vulnerabilities that are currently used in your application with useful links and information and proposed solutions. So it'll, you know, like as this example showing you, it's like telling you us to upgrade rack attack to 4.3.1 to, you know, deal with this, uh, this issue that was, a. a, a that has been, you know, advisory that was sent out in the Ruby community. So definitely recommend running this. This is one of my favorite tools that in the in the community for just checking on some of those things. It kind of keeps an eye on things so you don't have to know, be aware of every single vulnerability yourself. Another thing we will check on is how long has it been since Ruby, your automated tests have been run. So we run this quick little command and it's going to basically spit out when the last git commit was made to the spec directory. You can also, if you think that that application is using um, test unit, you could run that against the test directory as well. And it'll, you know, it's not uncommon for us to be exposed to or people will bring applications to us and we find out that it's been, you know, a good nine to 12 months since anything's been added there, but we can see a bunch of other commits for new features being added and the developers essentially just gave up on running automated tests or building new automated tests. And so those are usually kind of a hot area of things we would look for and that's going to make our life easier in the long run. And here's a few ex examples of why we see that tests get ignored. We get it. Developers have a lot of things on their plate and automated testing might not always be at the top of it. So perhaps the developers didn't have many tests in the first place. Maybe Rails upgrades caused some, the test suite to start failing. Perhaps if one developer was working on the project for a long time and didn't really see the value in it. 
and they were just constantly putting out fires or maybe the stakeholders said that they didn't have much budget and so developers just kind of you know decided what would be beneficial to invest time into or not and testing took a you know basically was a low priority on that on that project and so and one of my big counters to that would be how do you know things what you're working on is working and a developer will typically respond with well i tested it which usually means that they manually tested it with their browser or what have you so what i would really recommend is uh just kind of getting a sense of what the state of the automated testing can you run the test and kind of come up with a path for how you start moving forward and we can touch on like strategies for like how to best prioritize your time on getting the test suite back in some working order at a, in another presentation. Another thing is we're quick to check on is again, remember that we're this is a new project that we've just cloned. So we're going to check the application to find out if there's any credentials in the application that we probably shouldn't have access to. So we'll look at things in the like say let say the config directory. Are there any YAML files in there uh, that might have you know staging, production database credentials. Uh, third-party tools, MailChimp credentials, Stripe credentials. There's a lot of different services out there, AWS credentials, tools, access to information that we may not, we, we maybe perhaps shouldn't at this point in the relationship. Um, storing those in your Git repository is really, really bad idea because it's a little difficult to get rid of that information and that stuff should be managed through some other sort of approach and um, on your servers and stuff and not be something you actually store and keep versions on in the code base itself. You should be using a password manager of some sort to share those things with other developers. Step six, we're gonna go and see if we can seed the local database. So depending on the version of Rails you're running, we'd hope to find some seed data that we could load to help run application, run the application in our local development environment. One alternative solution is that we often see that we need to re load a recent database perhaps from like a database backup from production or staging environments to get the application to run in your local development environment. While this is kind of okay and can do the trick, especially if you're inheriting a project, it does have its own problems. For example, let's say your laptop gets stolen at the coffee shop because you had to run to the restroom and now your client's database is floating around who knows where. Some clients would not be happy to find out that that happened. So, is there anything in the seed, seeds data in the seeds file? Um, and if you're again, if you're having to manually load data, you know, leaning up production, data, there's there's some problems with that. So work on building flexible seed data. And again, you're playing with fire, but seriously, try to avoid downloading production data base, databases on a regular basis and sharing those amongst your development team. Find another way to do this. Step six: Are there any database indexes? This is like really really simple one in that you let's say you're using a modern database like postgres or mysql uh, we find that there's projects sometimes that even though this is conventional wisdom in some ways there are projects that have zero uh, database indexes on things like as simple as like if say a foreign key and so when you've got multiple uh, objects that are so let's say you're going to pull back a list of uh, users and you want to find associated data with those and display them on a page like those are joint building up some active active record is building up some join queries. And so one thing we can do quickly do is just find out if there's been any attention paid to database indexes. So we can run kind of like these few commands against, you know, from the from our command line to get a sense of how many indexes are currently in the database and compare those to the number of foreign keys that are listed in the database. And so if you see a disconnect in the numbers there, that can often tell you that um, there's probably some indexes that are missing. And so there's a number of other types of columns you'd also want to do that on for things like uh, single table inheritance or um, complex other complex joins or on really common uh, name scopes that you might be using in your active record models for things like, let's say, dot featured, and that's like a Boolean or something. You may want to put index on things that you're commonly querying against in, in kind of the where clause. And so um, you'll just need to go through your application and to kind of make sense of where that would be helpful. And there's plenty of literature out there on the internet that you can find on how to approach that and discover what those things be, might be. And then just, you know, do some database fine tuning. And so through that, you know, you're going to hopefully see some nice performance boost once you've, you've implemented some additional, some of those missing indexes and such. So, but 
again, if you don't put any indexes in there, it helps make our job easier when we're trying to make look like heroes because if we can add a few indexes and make the, the database queries you know, quite a bit faster, it makes us look really good. So thank you. So this other last step we try to take before we dive into a much deeper code audit is to basically find out what the previous developers have indicated need to be take, taken care of. So a really common thing that we found developers doing um, is to leave themselves and our future develop developers a little to-do note. We find these scattered across most projects with little notes. Occasionally, they can be quite amusing. So we'll run a quick command just to kind of grep the whole application. We'll say, let's say we'll start with the app directory and look for just the word to-do to show up. We run this command, and we usually will see a little list of to-dos, and we can maybe to get a better sense of some smelly areas of the code base and or, and or confusing things and or code that potentially could be removed. Developers are really good at writing things like, this should probably be removed and then not removing it. So let's find those things out, document them, and then we can look into that a little bit more and potentially speak to the previous developers to find out if that is actually true or not anymore. Closing thoughts. That's right. All right, so at this point, you know, we've just had a quick intro into diving into Ruby on Rails code audits. In the future presentation, we'll dive further into the system architecture and Ruby on Rails conventions and best practice. In the meantime, you know, these are important things to be doing across any application size. Um, look for things that you can kind of quickly take, you know, improve upon, you know, those consider low, low hanging fruit. If you pay for an audit um, and you're like run a business that's going to be having, you know, hiring a developer to do this, here's some things you should be making sure that they check on at a very, very minimum. Um, even if you don't understand the overall code itself. So and again, my name is Robbie Russell and I'm VP of Engineering at Planet Argon. If you're looking for help with your existing Ruby on Rails application, you should get in touch with us at planetargon.com. Thanks for watching.